keep the creativity alive. Man, I need to get somebody to hook me up with a theme song. What's happening, y'all? Welcome to Wednesday. It's time for the Revolution of One live stream. I'm so excited about today's guest and today's topic. So I'm going to be talking with my brother, Sean Thunder Wallace, or let me put the doctor before it. It's Dr. Sean Thunder Wallace. Sean Thunder Wallace is a, an award-winning jazz recording artist, uh, has, has over a handful of albums. He is also the director of jazz studies at Ohio State University, and he is also a minister of music. And, and today we're going to talk about why you need to turn off the news and keep creativity alive. Sean's been doing a lot of cool things to help people uh, not only develop their sense of creativity, but to stay in touch with the fact that your creative ability is an essential service and it is, it is as needed as anything else is going on in this time. So a lot of people are stressed out. A lot of people are tired of what the media is focusing on. And me and Dr. Wallace, we're going to kind of discuss that and, uh, and take a look at a new perspective on how to deal with some of those things. Dr. Wallace, man, thanks for joining me, brother. Thanks for having me on your program. Man, I love that setup, bro. Like, how can I get all that? How can I get that hook up? Uh, you have to stay broke. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's the direct path. That's all you need to know. <laughs> stay broke. <laughs> I, I, I've always loved that. I've always loved that sort of like the, the starving artist concept. I mean, it's become such a part of being an artist that you almost feel like you're a sellout once you start figuring out how to make money with your art. That's that's like a real struggle amongst many artists. Yeah, that's I mean, uh, you know, we we did a uh, we did you know I interviewed you on my quarantine interviews, and then we also yeah. did a Robbie Zacharias uh, special, and we talked a little bit about you know I mean at least I admitted that I I have struggled asking for the sale. And I finally got to the point where uh, I feel comfortable asking for the sale, so, you know, yeah. um, and wanting people to support. Um, you know, I, I, I never had a, a doubt that what it was that I was able to uh, provide, you know, the information and uh, performance, uh, you know, composition, all the different things that I do. I never thought that there was a lack of value there, but I think I've sort of been trained. I had been previously trained to sort of question, you know, that, that whole kind of used car salesman kind of thing. How much do I really want to sell myself? You know, I just want people just to, just to support me. And that's just not realistic. It's just yeah. not. Well, well you know, it's funny because you can, you can look at money as a purifying force as much as you can look at it as a corruptive force. And I think, you know, when you watch the way money is depicted on television, you kind of think about it as mostly a corrupted, corruptive force. You're an artist, you got your thing that you do, and once you bring money in, well, everything just gets all messed up. But thinking about the money forces you to really value yourself in a different way. And it also forces you to kind of think about your gift in terms of how am I using this to serve others? Because for artists, it's yeah. all too easy to be like, man, I'm just, I'm just writing for me. I'm just playing for me. It don't matter what anybody mm -hmm. else wants. Money makes you have to think about that. And that can be very healthy. You know, I have to say that uh, I think the generation after me, well, my generation and the generation after me, um, I feel like really struggled with uh, identity with respect to why we do things. Mm -hmm. Um, so for instance, uh, the way, the, 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 the reason I think that a lot of us have done things and have felt comfortable is just like you said, you know, I'm doing this for, for my, as long as I'm pleasing myself, I'm happy if, you know, if I'm broke, but then, Hey, I'm still happy. So everything is fine. And although I think that there's a lot of truth to that, uh, because our perspectives, uh, are, are individual. I mean, you can't see things out outside of your own perspective. And so you need to be pleased with what it is that you're doing. However, uh, you know, I think it's out of balance. Uh, and especially when you talk about jazz, which, you know, is a social music and the idea 
with the social music is not just to please yourself, but is also to please the audience. And you have to bring them into what it is that you're doing. And so I have gone through over the last probably 10 years, uh, a big transition in the way that I, I think about that. I was quite a purist early in my career uh, where it's like, hey, I'm going to play. I'm going to try to to, you know, play so much stuff that you don't know what I'm talking about. You know, almost that kind of thing. Uh, it's it's like the thing where, you know, you have professors that uh, as long as they're confusing someone, they feel like they've done a good job, you know. Um, and I've kind of gotten away from that kind of thinking and a lot more about really making a strong connection with the audience, really making a strong connection with the people that I'm trying to serve. And then once I've made that connection, then you can take them somewhere. And uh, so anyhow, yeah. Yeah, you, you know, your journey is an interesting one because you have been performing as a jazz musician since you were a child. And yeah. the academic side of things came later on, but you were like immediately immersed into a world of like being around top performers and so forth. And so you came into academia, into your college experience with already like over a decade of professional performing experience. I, I'm, w walk us through your journey a little bit. How did you get involved with music and then how did you get to the point where you went from recording artist to college professor? And I know you still do both. It's not either or, but walk me through that journey a little bit. Yeah, I mean, my dad is a terrific saxophone player um, and he had a record company and a studio. It was in the house. Uh, I'm talking about reel to reel. I mean, you had a four channel. I mean, the earliest I remember, it was like a four channel uh, reel to reel tape machine. And uh, he produced kind of like a Motown kind of R and B, uh, and he uh, and he was a and he was a writer, an arranger. Matter of fact, I I joked with him. I, I interviewed him for my quarantine interviews series, and uh, it, and he said that well, actually, in a previous conversation, he told me that uh, someone had contacted him and say, hey, you know, we want to pay you for. XYZ song. Now, these are songs that he wrote 40 years ago, you know, th like way long, long time ago. And yeah. uh, and now he's been getting big royalty checks for these for these things he did so long ago. And, you know, my joke to him was, you know, Dad, you finally made it. Uh, <laughs> talking about, you know, delayed gratification, you know, for something you've done a long time ago. But anyhow, uh, uh you know, so all of that stuff was happening in the house. Great music was happening in the house. Uh, my mom, uh, you know, took us to church. Um, we heard music there. We, you know, I heard everything from Miles Davis and, you know, to um, Andre Crouch and all the stuff that was on the radio, uh, you know, the power ballads of the 80s and all of that stuff. It was really, really influential. But I started playing saxophone when I was six because I heard my dad playing around the house. Um, and I got a lesson from him three or four days a week, three or four lessons per week. He was very, uh, specific about the way that he talked about playing the instrument. He wanted me to see it as something fun and not as a, not as a drudgery. And so rather than saying, okay, it's time to practice, he would always say, okay, let's get our horns out and let's play. And, uh, uh, mm. it's interesting how as you get older and you become more duty oriented and especially as men with all the responsibilities that uh, men take on uh, in our society, you know, as fathers, as leaders, you know, as administrators, as, you know, the, uh, the other things, you know, I'm a minister of music, all of the different things as a dad, uh, as a husband, all the different responsibilities. Uh, sometime, you know, in that period of time, I think I started to transition to thinking, thinking about practice as more of a task, something that I had to do, you know, as opposed to something that I get to do. And I'm trying to, and have been trying mm -hmm. to last several years to, to try to get back to thinking about it as playing. Now there's nothing, it, now it's not, it hasn't been totally negative uh, to think about it as this is a discipline. This is something that I must do. If I don't put this time in, then I'm not going to be able to accomplish X, Y, and Z. But trying to actually get to the point back to the point where when I'm in the practice room, um, 
I'm actually enjoying the process, the journey, and and not just so focused on the destination. Uh, but you know, I started recording when I was uh, 14. My first record came out was 14. I was perf- uh, performing professionally starting at age nine. Uh, there's a video on my YouTube channel of me playing Moments Notice uh, with Rodney Whitaker and my dad and Francisco Mora. And, uh, that was when I was 13. Uh, and you know, and then I had, a hand, I had what three or four recordings out before I went to college. Uh, so a lot of composing, arranging, um, uh, and you know, a lot of performing, you know, I played on big festivals. Um, I did, uh, Phil Donahue show when I was 19, uh, CBS Sunday morning did a story on me when I was in college. Um, uh, I, it was on BET, uh, Jazz Central. So, you know, I've done a, a, a variety of sort of high profile things. I opened for Ray Charles when I was 14. Um, but all of that stuff was made possible because my dad was so supportive. My family was so supportive uh, and and uh, allowed me to, uh, you know, have the time to really dedicate towards things that were going to uh, sow into my future, things that were important. Uh, so, I mean, that's sort of the short story. I mean, we can, we could go into, you know, working, you know, how I got my first teaching gig at Ohio state and things, but, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's sort of the long and short of it. Yeah. I'm, so I'm kind of curious about your, your decision to go to college and what drove that, because for most people, that decision is at least a, a perceived investment in career. You know, uh, there's something that I want to do. I, I want to get the credentials so that I can be able to do that. For you, you certainly didn't need that to, to make albums, to, to perform and things along those lines. So what was it that made you go to college? And um, what, yeah, yeah, tell me about that, about that side of things. Well, actually, when I, uh, when I graduated high school, I didn't want to go to college. Um, mm. And so I did uh, for the first year. Uh, I stayed at home and I practiced all day, practiced like eight hours a day. I was writing music and um, doing stuff in the studio. Um, as as the years went on, our studio became more and more advanced. Um, matter of fact, a couple of the recordings that, that I did were actually recorded in, in my house, uh, you know, my parents' house. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's what I did the first year. And then, you know, after the first year, I was like, okay, well, maybe maybe I should consider going to school. And so my dad made a deal with me. Uh, he said that uh, I will pay, I will reimburse 100% of at least a B. And so there was a community college. I uh, went to Lansing Community College for a year, took care of a lot of general education courses. And because I had already done the work, it was not necessary for me to take an ACT or an SAT. And so to this day, I have still never taken uh, one of those standardized uh, entry tests. I didn't take a GRE when I went to graduate school. Uh, by the time I did my doctorate, uh, they had changed the, the, the policy on GREs in the arts, uh, well, in particular uh, in music. Uh, I went to CCM, um, University of Cincinnati. And so I didn't take a GRE when I was going to that school, but I did my master's degree at the same school. I did my undergrad, so I didn't have to take a GRE uh, to continue on. And uh, now I'm not trying to encourage people to avoid taking those, uh, but I'm suggesting that there are several different pathways, uh, you know, to completing something. You you don't have to, uh, some people do the straight through approach. Uh, Some people, um, you know, take time, you know, to figure out what's going on. I, I, I did what's called, what's referred to now as a gap year or no, wait a minute. Is it a gap year? What's, what's, what's the term when high yep. school students it. decide it's the gap year. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I took a gap year. Um, and uh, now as far as my career path, uh, I just knew that, you know, going to school, uh, was the next step for me. Um, I think if things had gone differently that for that year that I took off, I mean, maybe I wouldn't have gone to school. I mean, I was playing a lot, but it just made a lot of sense to take advantage of scholarships. And frankly, scholarship money is usually reserved for young, young students. Uh, And so I was like, okay, all right, so I need to 
get this moving, go to school, get some classes under my belt, show that I can do the work and then see if I can get some scholarships. And uh, so I was a full scholarship student for all of my degrees, um, which was a, a, a great blessing. Um, I think a lot of the time that I spent practicing and, and all of the hours, instead of maybe riding my bike or hanging out with my friends when I was in the practice room, um, I think that really paid off for me. Um, I remember my dad telling me that, you know, you're not going somewhere that they're not paying for everything. I mean, so that was, I mean, that was the, that was the standard, you know? So <laughs> when I went to Western, I went to Western, uh, I liked the school. It was great, but they also gave me full scholarship. Um, and, uh, so anyhow. Yeah, man. Well, one of the things I really like about your, your social media, when I look at your Instagram page or your YouTube, you have different types of videos. Like you have your hot licks series, or, or I've seen videos of you actually giving lessons to your, your students and so forth. And I, I get a chance to watch that teaching process. What would you say is the biggest difference for you in terms of being a professor versus being a performer? What, what are you learning by teaching your students that you didn't quite learn by being out there performing? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Well, let me back up just a little bit because uh, when I was about, I don't know, 12 or 13, I started teaching lessons, uh, private, private lessons. And wow. honestly, it was, it wasn't a good experience. I'm sorry. Uh, well, it was, it was younger students. Sometimes it was older students, uh, people that were older than me, but usually it was younger students, people that were just, you know, kids that were just getting started out. Yeah. And, uh, I have to say it wasn't, it wasn't really a good experience because, uh, I was like personally offended by the lack of seriousness <laughs> that uh, it now, and this is, and I've had to, I've had to change my thinking about a lot of things. I mean, I have a six year old now and, yeah. uh, and when I look at the kinds of things that he wants to do and his ability to focus or lack thereof, uh, <laughs> it gives me a different perspective on some of the kids that I was teaching. Now, they were older than six, but, uh, you know, sometimes they were 10, you know, sometimes they were nine or whatever. And when I started trying to teach them and I give them specific things to work on and they come back next week and they hadn't practiced and it was like a disrespect to the music. Like I was, I was hurting my soul by it. And that convinced me that I never wanted to be a teacher. I was like, <laughs> I'm not going to be a teacher. I hate teaching. Teaching sucks. You know, I am not, you know, letting, you know, people come in and disrespect, you know, what it is, you know, you know that I'm trying to do with my life. You know, it was that kind of thing. And it actually wasn't until I was in college in, uh, that you... <laughs> <laughs> and maybe a couple others around the same time uh, encouraged me and and told me, I, I know that you have this thing against teaching, but dude, you're a teacher. <laughs> and uh, I think, you know, and it took me a couple weeks after that to realize that, you know what? Yes, I am a teacher. All of this other stuff. I mean, it was like leading Bible studies and stuff and teaching lessons in the kind of information that I was interested in, it made, it was obvious that I'm a, that I was a teacher. It, it, had it not been for that negative experience, I probably would have always thought I was going to be a teacher. Um, but teaching to me is not a cop out. And it's not the, 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 the there's the saying, uh, those that can't do teach. And I think mm. that is horrible. That's a terrible, that, that, that is, <laughs> that's the worst thing. Because if you can't do I don't want you spreading your poison. You know, mm. what are you going to teach people how not to be able to do? You know, uh, you need to be able to do and you need to be able to do at the highest possible level so that you can model what it is that you're trying to get the students to uh, to do. And also so that you can serve as an inspiration. You know, oh, yeah. this is oh, that's the, that's the goal right there. I want to be able to do that, you know, and. Uh, in my in my teaching, my teaching is about half playing with the student and half uh, discussing with them. And you know they always ask me questions. Um, we always 
uh, talk about what the specific next step is going to be as far as the curriculum. Um, you know, all of that stuff is, is, is happening, but it's a lot of playing. And so I'm doing and, and they're seeing how I'm doing. And then we discuss how I'm doing. Right. So the idea that, you know, those that can't do teach is horrible. That is just not the, the, you know, at least in my teaching style, it's, it's not something that, uh, would work out very well. Uh, but teaching has definitely instructed my performing, um, in that in order to be able to teach well, you have to understand concepts very well. Uh, because if you don't understand them well, you can't express, express them in a clear, concise, understandable, you know, way. Um, you know, this kind of a running joke and sort of in the jazz community where, you know, if someone really doesn't know how to explain something, they'll just tell you, oh man, you'll just hear it. Oh, you'll hear it. <laughs> but, but that's not a, you know, that's not a lesson. You know, you, you, you can't sit in a lesson and be like, and they're asking you, Hey, what are you playing there? And what kind of chord is that, that you're playing in that? Uh, yeah, you know, you'll just hear it. You'll just hear it. You know, that's, yeah. you know, that would be terrible teaching. Um, so, uh, with the ex the added precision of being able to explain, it actually helps me to focus on what it is that I'm doing and I get better at it. Yeah, I, I love that philosophy. There's a, a phrase I like to use when talking to a lot of my students about about learning, and it's it's called learning out loud, where you actually let people watch you or, or, or see you navigate the learning process. And and you try to document what it is you're learning in a way that leaves a digital footprint or a rabbit trail for other people to come along and follow, because yes. you have to understand what you're doing differently when when you're forced to document it or, or or present it in a way that makes sense to someone else. I mean, most people our age, or, or most people, by the time they get to what, like fifth, sixth grade, I don't remember when you learn these things, but like you, you may know fractions, right? You know multiplication and division, but go try to teach that to somebody that doesn't understand fractions, multiplication or division. And then you start to realize you've got so many assumptions, so many things that you take for granted and the process of having to help someone else understand it really makes you more aware of your own thinking and it, it just makes you better at what it is you do you know you know I, I experienced oh go 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 ahead no no, no I, actually go ahead we we, we have a delay oh, so I, I, yeah I, 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 so i i experienced this uh precision added precision in in understanding of what it is that i'm doing uh, in even a more profound way, uh, when I, uh, when I wrote my book, how to improvise over chord changes. Now the material in the book is material that I had been teaching at Ohio state, uh, in both applied lessons and in the improvisation sequence and information, uh, or material that I had taught prior to working at Ohio state. But, you know, uh, me and my team, we took about six years to actually put all of that stuff in a systematic format and to really iron out all the wrinkles to make it extremely clear and precise. Have, and having to do that has made me better at all of the concepts that are within. You know, because I because I've had to, you know, let alone being able to, you, you have to be able to demonstrate concepts. You know, you can't, you can't just be like, well, you know, just play this exercise in the book. I'll say, okay, well, that's great. I want to hear you play that exercise in the book. And then once you play that exercise, I want to hear how you can, you know, integrate that into your improvising, you know, so, the, and that's another level of understanding, you know, there's a, there's a difference between, uh, you know, learning something intact and it's sort of a brittle sort of flimsy like if you miss one note like you're totally you're totally off you know you have to stop and wait for it to come back around again there's there's that and then there's having it so thoroughly mastered that you're able to incorporate that concept into the other things that you do 
And then mm. with all of the implications of all those intersections and, you know, interactions, uh, you know, one thing, I mean, I think there's a direct relationship with, with, between that and communication, you know, uh, one thing, fortunately that we see in the media very often, more often than not, 95% of the time <laughs> or something, some high percentage is you'll have, uh, on programs where you actually will have different perspectives, you'll have talking points and then talking points and actually no actual assimilation of any of the information. So it's as if, and then you can see both of the, the folks go onto another show and they're saying the same talking points and their talking points have not even been, been nuanced to accommodate things that they heard from a different perspective in a show that they did previously. So the talking points have been, they're cemented and, uh, and they don't really listen to each other and no one learns anything, you know, mm -hmm. and it's almost as if, and I think that's like lazy. It's, that's like the lazy way to, to go about it. It takes a lot of time to actually develop the ability to have flexibility with concepts and communication. It takes a lot of time to do that. And you have to read a lot and you have to know a lot of information because your weak spots can so easily be exposed, exposed. Whereas yeah. uh, just learning some talking points and becoming a good speaker of those talking points, that's pretty easy to do. Yeah, man, 100%. You know, it, it's so funny because uh, I was just talking with someone about this yesterday. When you look at all of the discussions that are, that are being had right now, all of these debates on on politics, on on race, on culture, on, on health, you would think that in order to participate in these debates, the number one thing you need to do is go, go run out and buy a book on politics or race or health. But I think what most people need to run out and go get is a book on like basic elementary logic, you know? Uh, learn about logical yeah. fallacy. Learn how to construct an argument. Learn how to recognize an argument. Learn how to understand what an inference actually is and when there's a true inferential connection between premises and conclusions. And even perhaps more fundamental than that, I, I, think, I think the nation is kind of being exposed right now. I think the average person doesn't have a guiding philosophy of conflict resolution. Right. Like like a philosophy of what do we do when we disagree about something really important and we still need to get along to we still need to get along with each other. Most people, they don't even begin to wrestle with that until maybe they get married. Right. Because that's the first time where you might have like serious disagreements with somebody that you're highly incentivized to get along with. But, you know, most people, you can just sort of shout at someone that thinks differently than you. You don't need to get along with any of the people on the Internet. And so most people don't have a philosophy of conflict resolution. How do you communicate with someone? How do you listen? What are your guiding principles? And right now we're seeing our nation's inability to do conflict resolution put on display. But the fundamental problem is really one of communication, critical thinking, knowing how to talk, knowing how to listen, knowing how to like charitably interpret what someone else is saying to you. These are all the things that are missing right now. I don't think the fundamental problem is that people haven't read enough books on race or health or politics. That stuff is very important, but it's just people haven't really learned how to think and communicate clearly at all, you know? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, yeah, it is it is unfortunate because I think only you're not going to have this moment forever where large percentages of the population are actually open to the idea of change. They're aware of, of a problem. And it seems that everyone is aware of this problem. So we can either utilize this time and actually uh, have some meaningful conversations and actually move this conversation forward, you know, or we can basically just be frustrated more after this thing is over because nothing changed because nobody could talk. 
<laughs> you, have, you have an interesting position on this. Um, you, you, I, on, on one side, you have this position where, where your attitude is don't run away from tough conversations. In fact, you wrote a Facebook post about religion and politics that I, I thought was pretty interesting, where you, you basically said, I think you should talk about religion and politics, right? Like, like I, I think you should talk about it. Everybody says don't talk about it, but I think you should because it's important to be really non-dramatic about tough discussions because the more dramatic we are, the, you know, the, the more attention we're going to bring into it. But then you also have this philosophy of, hey, just turn off the news for a little bit and, and focus yeah. on making art, focus on developing your spirituality. And, and I want to hear from you on that side of things, because I'm talking to a lot of people that are feeling like, man, I don't want to be irresponsible, right? I don't want to be the one person that's like, I just can't take the discussion anymore. But at the same time, it's it's too intense. I'm worn out. How many videos can I watch of like bad things happening? <laughs> How many conversations can I have where, where nobody's listening to each other anyway and everyone's being offended? I want to hear from mm -hmm. you on why we should even care to or, 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 or what, what's the logic behind like turning off the news for a little bit and focusing on creative work. So we have a, a couple you know, unprecedented events that happened back to back. And I know that it's not politically correct to imply, insinuate, or flat out say that the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, in some ways facilitated and created the sort of precondition and the climate, the added tension and frustration and just people wanting to just get out of their houses and go and do something else. There was that. And then these these uh, unfortunate events with uh, George Floyd and um, and our. <sighs> there's a history of impropriety. Um, and this coronavirus pandemic was sort of the powder keg. And this event was the straw that broke the camel's back. And everything just blew up and became, you know, bigger than, you know, bigger than life. And now I don't diminish the validity or, uh, you know, the validity of, of what's happening right now. Um, I don't diminish uh, how people feel. People are, 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 are quite emotional about what's going on right now. I don't diminish that. Um, I am not a fan of the 24 hour news cycle. Mm. Uh, I wasn't a fan of that long ago. The news tends to focus on things that have happened over the last week or two, then recycles to start focusing on other things. Now we've been sort of focused on the same topics for three months, three and a half months. You know, we've been focused on the same topics um, with no real movement, just kind of regurgitating the same points and saying the same thing over and over. I don't think it's necessary to sit in front of a TV to hear the same thing over and over and over. I like to be informed about what's going on, but once I'm sniffing out that they're just going to try to spin this a thousand different ways to get more people to watch, that's when I, uh, you know, that's when I'm going to say, okay, that's enough of that. I mean, I knew it was an issue when, at least with the coronavirus pandemic, that 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 this was, you know, going to be, you know, a bigger deal and was an issue when no matter what I was doing, if I was trying to watch Netflix, if I was getting on Facebook, if I was posting on Instagram, if I was trying to pay my electric bill, um, you know, if, you know, emails that I was getting from, uh, you know, the union, <laughs> the musicians union that I belong to, uh, uh, messaging from churches, 
you know, from universities, I mean, I'm getting so many emails like every day from, you know, administrators at Ohio State, you know, I knew it was a deal when I was just so bombarded with this is how we're going to respond to this. And this is how we're going to respond to this. And I'm like, man, you know, you, you, you open up social media, Facebook, Instagram, you know, heck, getting on TikTok. And they have like some kind of statement about coronavirus and what they're doing, you know, and, you know, I, I'm, I don't want to be, I'm not trying to be the person that is trying to close their eyes, but come on, man. I mean, it, it used to be that you could turn the TV off. And then if I got on a streaming service like Netflix, that I didn't have to see another <laughs> message that I just turned off the same messaging. So, uh, so, so that's too much. It's, it's overload. And I don't know that that's healthy. I, I know it's not healthy. Um, and the fact is, is that most of us have to work. And so since you, we have to work, it is not, you, you can't spend the amount of time that would be necessary to watch all of these pro all these programs. So I think there's a, there's a limit to what, what we can take in, what we can absorb and what we can do something positive with. Now, on the other hand, um, you know, look, uh, the, the best thing that we can do is put positive stuff out in the, in the universe. That's the best thing that we can do. Uh, it helps other people that are then they themselves are feeling overwhelmed by this 24 hour news cycle and they just want something positive, you know, and it's not like in, for instance, in my quarantine interviews, the quarantine interviews weren't really about the cor coronavirus. Okay. Now I named it that. Yeah. It was like a marketing thing, whatever, but really it, now we didn't avoid the topic, but we were talking about, you know, Hey, how did you, why, why are you a musician? Why did you, decide that, you know, music was going to be th the thing for you, you know, and isn't music such a therapeutic and positive force? You know, I mean, we're talking about these kinds of positive topics that, um, you know, especially kids uh, would be, I think, hopefully inspired by to see some of their heroes, you know, to, you know, to see what their process was and to see that it wasn't all like, you know, a road paved with gold. There were some challenges and they had to overcome those challenges and persevere and be diligent and all these kind of positive kind of themes. Um, so I think putting positivity, uh, using our creativity to put some stuff that is, uh, you know, that's, that's worth something that's, that's going to help somebody other than ourselves. I think that's a great way to actually improve the situation. You know, it might not be a direct way. We might not specifically be using the talking points that uh, CNN or MSNBC or Fox News or whatever it is that, that any of them want us to use. That's not important. What's important is that uh, we as individuals do what only we can do to improve the world. Yeah, that's right on the money. You know, with, with respect to, to focusing on positive truths, one of the things I like to say to people about this is that the truth is still the truth, even if it makes you feel good, you know? Um, so, you know, if your kid can't sleep at night because they believe there's a monster under the bed or, or there's a monster in the closet, and I say, hey, look, there's no need to be afraid. There's no monster on, under the bed. There's no monster, on, you know, in the closet. You can say to me, oh, TK, you're just telling that little kid that to make them feel good. Yes, you're absolutely right. And it's still true, right? Uh, we, 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 we kind of have this sort of suspicion of like saying things or showing people things because it makes them feel good. Whereas, you know, we just sort of automatically attribute trustworthiness to anyone that's telling it like it is because telling it like it is means, you know, giving you the negative stuff. But there are a lot of positive truths that are as factual as any negative truths and we need to be aware of those. I, I think if you truly want to manipulate people, the best way to do it isn't by giving them bad information. 
The best way to do it is by controlling their definition of what it means to be informed. Because once you've given somebody a terrible definition of what it means to be informed, they will feed themselves bad information. You don't even have to give them bad information. They will go looking for it because you control their definition of what it means to be informed. And, and it's so funny how there are so many people who say, well, I just want to be informed. And they use that as the basis for like filling their heads with all of these stories, most of which they can't do anything about, most of which make them feel terrible and more depressed. And yet these people are completely illiterate and uninformed about some great music that's out there, about some great books on how to improve your marriage, how to build a business, how to how to become more financially literate. They don't know anything about the players and the names in that space, but they know everything about who's arguing about what. They can name all the commentators on CNN and that sort of thing. So it's like you're always informed about something and you're always uninformed about a, a, a greater number of things. And I think the beginning right. of freedom kind of deciding for yourself what it means to be informed and, and what purposes and goals will drive your concept of what being informed is, you know? Yes. You know, uh, you know, one thing that is, one thing that I don't like is this sort of, uh, almost a guilt trip that certain folks put on others for mm. not being quote unquote, as engaged or as aware as they are. And part of it is f exactly for the reason that you just said, you have to choose what you're going to be informed about, which means that there's a lot of other stuff that you're not going to be informed about. It's a commitment of sorts, you know? So if I'm going to be truly committed to my art, uh, to uh, you know, even to, to, uh, doing the, the best podcast that I can do the best, you know, interviews that I can do. Um, if I'm going to be, uh, you know, informed about that and improving those things, there's an implication of time that, I mean, I have to spend a certain amount of time acquiring those skills, getting informed about that. And we're always making these trade-offs. We're always making these trade-offs. I can't sit in front of a TV and watch 24 hours of news, even though we're in this critical time and there's, you know, and it's so important, I still can't do that. And nobody can do that, really. Nobody really can do that. You know, heck, the, the, the folks that are on the news, the, you know, the anchors, they're not doing that. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I mean, they can't, they can't do that. Uh, so I don't know. I, I just, you know, I think, I think it would be a really good thing if we, I, when I say this, I don't want people to take it like I'm saying, this is not important what's happening, but I think we need to lighten up. We need to calm down. And I think if we start to get, once we start to get our emotions in check, then I think we'll be in better position to actually have meaningful conversations. Um, and what better way to distract us from some of the evils in the world than to be all about creating something that's beautiful? Yeah, man, you, you're right on the, right on the money, you know, I think on the surface, this sounds irresponsible, but if you look at the history of how change happens, you'll find that there's more substance to the statement than you might think. And that is, you are far more likely to change the world by writing a script or composing a song than by engaging in heated debates about whatever topic is trending right now, even if it seems to be important. You know, the, the urgent and the important are two different things. You, you think about the technologies and tools that make it possible for us to even discuss these issues right now. Most of these technologies and tools did not come about as the result of an immediate need to respond to a crisis. You know, so if you take away the, the mobile camera, 
half of the discussions and debates we're having go away because we don't have the ability to all walk around with cell phones that allow us to document things that are happening. But why do we have mobile cell phones? Was it because someone was responding to an immediate crisis or was it because they were operating from a mindset of innovation? How can I introduce new possibilities to the world? How can I do something cool? We didn't get the cell phone because someone wanted to further the discussion on police brutality. That's not why we have the cell phone, uh. right? That's a positive externality. You know, why do we have Google? Why do we have Amazon? Why do we have YouTube? We don't have YouTube because someone sat down and said, hey, what can I do to solve the most urgent problem that's happening right now? We don't have YouTube so that we can like, you know, have political debates. But the ability to have political debates is a positive externality of creating YouTube. And so the very tools that give us options and that allow us to create a freer world, they have to come from a non-reactive space. They have to come from a mindset that says there is more to being human than putting out fires and refuting bad arguments. There's also doing things from a space of what other possibility have we not yet considered? What should I produce merely because it delights me and makes me come alive? There's so much value in that. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, man, you know, okay, go ahead. You got it. <laughs> it's all you, bro. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. No, I'm, I'm giving it back to you again. No, I'm just joking. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, a, a lot of these different, <laughs> a lot of these different projects that I'm involved in right now, um, they were a way to consistently create positive content. And when I thought to do these things, uh, the interview series, uh, even the Hot Licks series, I had no idea of who uh these you know these materials would reach and how it was going to impact them i just knew that i wanted to do something positive and i knew that um you know developing the skills th that i would be able to develop more skills to to refine as i was going on going along i mean you can't wait until you know how to do something to start doing something um, I think that's a composer's, it's, it's a, it's a misconception about the composition process. Um, if you, if you consider this analogy with music, composers were not looking at a list of rules that they must abide by and then composing music that followed the rules but rather composers assimilated music from the past and brought the conversation forward by using their own sense of things, their own creativity to create something new. And an issue sometimes people get this out of order with music theory as it relates to composition is music theory afterwards afterwards looks at completed works and then creates terminology that explains principles that they they perceive in the music and then understanding music theory can put you in a situation to provide a shortcut but music theory didn't come first music theory always comes afterwards so you create this something new and you know often the folks that are composing music they're not aware of specific principles that facilitate their composition they just hear a song and they express it and yes they're they're affected by all of their musical knowledge. They're affected by, you know, the world that we live in and all the music that they've heard. If they've, they've, they're affected by all that stuff uh, and inspired by that stuff, influenced by that stuff, but they're not influenced by a list of rules. And my process has, has tended to be 
just start doing something that you want to do. And as you're doing it, you'll start to develop an understanding of what's going on. And as you encounter problems, there's so much information out here now to figure out how to solve those problems. Um, that just seems like a, uh, like, I think that's actually what people are doing anyway. And, and even if you think that you're using rules to, to govern things, you still don't know how those rules directly apply to what it is that you're going to end up actually doing. So anyhow. Yeah, I love it, man. So I know you and I both love to read. I'm going to recommend a book and, and, and I love for you to recommend one. Um, it, it's actually an economics book that you can read and, and, and you won't even know that it's about economics. But it's a book called I Pencil, and it's written by Leonard Reed, who is the founder mm -hmm. of Fee Foundation for Economic Education. And it's a very short book, and it, it, it's it's an allegory, and it's told from the perspective of a pencil, and the pencil is telling you the story of how it came into existence, and it's this beautiful illustration of a concept in economics called spontaneous order, which is the way we get some of the most beautiful and brilliant things in our world, it's not the result of knowing how to create it ahead of time. It's not the result of central planning. It's the result of this magical looking process where things come together that bring so much value to people's lives, but it's the outcome of a bunch of different individuals acting in their self-interest without even knowing that they're contributing to the orchestration of something really valuable. And I think that book kind of captures my philosophy of how you change the world. You know, the way this, the way you change the world is the same way you make a pencil, not by knowing ahead of time mm -hmm. that what you do is guaranteed to alter the world in some specific way, but by following the work that makes your life meaningful, that brings you joy, um, and then trusting the process that that is ultimately the best way to help humanity. There's a quote by Howard Thurman I say all the time, where he says, ask not yourself what the world needs, but rather what makes you come alive, for that is what the needs, people who have come alive. And I encourage you all to go read. Mm -hmm. I, I, if that feels too hard, then go watch a YouTube video. Just type it in iPencil, and it's like a, a roughly about 10-minute animation um, version of it uh, produced by, by Nicholas Tucker that captures the same story. All right, Thunder, what about you? I'm going to suggest a couple things. Um... One of the things that I'm going to suggest is uh, the the website Blinkist. Um, it's an app also. And what Blinkist does is it sort of gives you like a cliff notes of whatever the book is. Um, and, uh, and it has both uh, sort of like PDF files, basically, where, uh, you know, it's like, I don't know, 20 pages on, on, you know, to get all the information from a particular book. Uh, but then also there are audio versions of it. Uh, so that's, that's one thing that I would suggest, especially for nonfiction, uh, because there's a lot of books coming out all of the time. And, uh, uh if you're like me, I, I, I am very busy. I've got a lot of things going on, but I also want to be able to be informed and and uh, and all of that. So I think that that's a really great resource, Blinkist. Um, and then another thing that I'm going to suggest is uh, uh, get into audiobooks. Um, what what's the what's the uh, Amazon associated? Uh, what is that called? Um, Audible. Audible. Th thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, so, you know, get get comfortable with, you know, with with technology so it can facilitate the consumption of of these things. I mean, I'm always listening to like audio uh, uh, audio books, especially when I go to the gym and I'm a five five days a week uh gym person. So that gives me a lot of time that I can be actually consuming uh, material. But then the other book that I'm going to suggest to read, and this is not off the beaten path or anything, and 
probably many of the people that are watching this already know about this book, but it's Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. Um, I, I just, that's just a powerful book. Um, I, uh, I am very impressed by Jordan Peterson and this sort of movement that he started. Uh, I can't think of a time in my lifetime where someone that is talking about the kinds of uh, philosophical topics about meaning and purpose and, um, you know, accomplishing something and make and doing things of value, all of those kind of conversations, which are really deep and filling up these huge, you know, these huge uh, uh, concert venues around the country. It's just totally incredible uh, what's going on, uh, you know, what has been going on with Jordan Peterson. Um, I think that in my mind, Jordan, Jordan Peterson has kind of, he, he's, he's, he's kind of taken the, what Ravi Zacharias did. And it's a little more universal, I think, what Jordan Peterson is doing, but it is just as deep um, and thought provoking um, and impactful. So 12, 12 rules for life, Jordan Peterson. Yeah, you know, the, the, the funny thing about Peterson to me is that this guy was toiling away in obscurity for years. You can go back like to his YouTube channel and find these old uh, videos of lectures of him talking about like the philosophy of language, him talking about mythology and all these interesting, fascinating things. And I mean, this was before Jordan Peterson started dressing GQ, right? Like this is old school stuff, like full out like 12 part series where every video is almost two hours long. And then he made a couple of political points, points that had this huge spotlight shined on him. And so a lot of critics kind of only knew about that Jordan Peterson. And so there are a lot of people that never went deeper to hear a lot of the interesting yeah. stuff that he had to say about the things that he's been talking about for a very long time. So there's a huge difference between like, the, the researcher, scholar, and professor that has been around for a long time and sort of like the, the pop culture version that a lot of people get by reading quick hit pieces. Um, I, I definitely would recommend that book too. I should have you back on in the future, man, to, to talk about, maybe to talk about some concepts in that book because I think that's just as relevant to this time as any other time because there are a lot of people trying to figure out how to take charge of their lives, how to make the world better, and I think having a conversation about that that's non-reactive, you know, so, so people can understand that everybody doesn't need to be a journalist. Everybody doesn't need to be posting nonstop updates about COVID-19 or George Floyd in order to be making the world a better place. And maybe we can talk about some of the insights in that book um, and how people can put that in application and maybe even discuss some of the objections that have been made. What do you think of that, man? I'm totally into it, man. Yeah. I think that'd be fine. Brother, we're at time. I appreciate you joining me, man. This was awesome. And I love hearing your thoughts, bro. Well, God bless you, man. Thank you so much. Hey, and, and uh, for, for quarantine conversations, um, for finding out info, info about you, tell the people where to, where to reach out to you, man. Uh, so, yeah, it's pretty easy to find me. Uh, Dr. Thunder Music on, on Instagram. Uh, Dr. Thunder Music on, uh, on YouTube. Um, Dr. Thunder Music, uh, www.drthundermusic.com is my website. Um, and the quarantine interviews, uh, I was calling the, my interview series that, and that actually ended at episode 50. But continuing on, uh, the series is now called uh, Conversations with Dr. Thunder. Uh, and actually, tonight I'm interviewing Branford Marcellus. Oh, wow. Uh, which is, uh, this is pretty cool. We have some interesting history in common um, that having to do with the Donnie, Phil Donahue show. Well, I look forward to hearing that interview, brother. And uh, every Wednesday, I'll be here, you know, doing a live stream, uh, just like what you're watching right now at noon. And also on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I've got my TK's two cents where I discuss two tweets and give a couple of thoughts about each one, take you beyond 140 characters. Thanks for tuning in, everybody, and I will see you for TK's Two Cents 
at 12 p.m. Eastern Time live tomorrow. Thanks, th thanks, Doctor Thunder. All right, man.